Hello and welcome to the eOrganic webinar on the effects of climate change on insect communities and organic farming systems by David Crowder of Washington State University. My name is Alice Formiga and I'm the webinar coordinator for eOrganic. eOrganic is the organic agriculture community of practice with eExtension. You can find all of our public articles, videos, and our many upcoming and recorded webinars on organic farming and research topics on our website at extension.org slash organic underscore production. Before we begin, I'd like to briefly introduce today's speaker. David Crowder is an assistant professor of entomology at Washington State University. His research focuses on the effects of farming systems and climate change on the ecology of insect and plant communities. I want to thank Alice and uh, eOrganic for setting this up. Um, you know, thank you to all of you who have logged on and are listening. Um, it's, I'm happy to be speaking here today. Um, We've been doing a lot of research here in Washington State and the Pacific Northwest trying to look at how um, organic farming practices affect Muted. different things like insect biodiversity and the ecology of insects and agricultural systems. Um, in particular, right now we've been looking a lot at biological control so how do predators control prey in organic systems? So today I'm going to be talking about some of these issues that we've been looking at um, and talk about some of the case studies we've done here in some Washington systems and hopefully be able to tie it to some broader processes that we think will affect a lot of different organic farming systems. So I'd like to start off with just a little bit of an introduction about what we know about climate change um, and how that's affecting kind of just the world globally, give a global perspective on climate change and then bring it back to kind of what do we expect the effects to be for agriculture and how is that affecting um, you if you're a grower in an organic farming system versus if you're um, using more conventional methods. So probably a lot of you out there have seen a similar version of this graph here. Um, which just shows the global changes in temperature over the last 150 years or so. So this is basically plotted on the y-axis um, is a variation in temperature from a normal period. Um, and you can see here in the little um, blue bar we have here, um, you know, this is the area that they're comparing. So the average global temperatures from the 1960s to the 1980s and how do things compare? Um, and we can see pretty much across the board in the northern hemisphere, the southern hemisphere, and globally, um, we've had about, you know, one to two degree increase, um, degrees Celsius, over the last 150 years. Um, and that may, you know, not seem like a very large amount, but obviously we've been seeing a lot of effects, you know, on the polar ice caps melting, a lot of um, habitat has been changing. And actually, as the human population continues to grow, um, these changes in temperature are expected to increase more rapidly where um, projections are anywhere between a two to four degree increase Celsius um, over the next hundred years or so. So kind of a lot of the work on climate change has been based on different modeling scenarios. Um, you know, obviously when we're projecting forward what's going to happen, um, we're using ecological models combined with our knowledge of how weather patterns change to predict the effects of climate change on different um, variables and ecosystems that we're interested in. So this graph here is showing um, on the x-axis you can see a little variation in the sensitivity of ecosystems. Um, basically what this means is a scientist predicting whether or not the ecosystems will change. So will things, you know, that are in grasslands now be changing into, you know, different kind of ecosystems? Will tundra be changing? So this is um, showing the sensitivity of ecosystems to change. Um, we can see up in, you know, Canada and, you know, a lot of Russia, Siberia, the areas that tend to be colder are expected to be more sensitive to climate change. Um, those ecosystems are expected to be changing more rapidly than a lot of the ecosystems, say, in Africa or around the equator, um, which are believed to be a little bit more resilient to the effects of climate change. So moving forward, um, again, a projection on what do we expect climate change to result in habitat loss. 
Um, so this is the habitat that it, as it currently has, as it currently stands, how will it change? Again, we can see, you know, the highest impacts are expected to be, you know, in Canada and in Russia, the, the colder areas, um, the equator habitat loss is expected to be more minimally. But as we know, you know, as you're having these habitat losses in the northern hemispheres, um, in the polar ice caps, you know, these things are going to eventually affect kind of the entire world uh, global ecosystem. So, you know, where we work here in the Pacific Northwest, um, circling it here, is expected to be a fairly sensitive area, you know, to climate change. We have a more um, temperate climate and the effects are expected to, to magnify in these areas. So just continuing on, what are we expecting with global species loss? And this was a recent paper um, in 2000. What do we expect for the number of species that are being lost? Um, again, as we have darker shades of red, um, increasing expectations of species loss. So you can see a lot of um, habitats are expected to be somewhere in probably the 3 to 10 percent um, range of species are being lost. And this is just due to climate change. So it's been pretty well accepted um, among scientists since the early 1990s and the 1980s that, you know, human beings are really causing a mass extinction event. Um, and climate change appears to be one of the major factors that is really resulting in this species loss. Um, some of the other factors are just increased human commerce. Um, is causing more invasive species. Um, invasive species getting into these ecosystems is causing species loss. And then one of the other major ones is agricultural intensification. So, you know, we've been seeing a lot of increase in agriculture um, in South America, in Asia. Um, you know, some of the classic studies are, you know, kind of slash and burn agriculture to grow corn for ethanol in Brazil and Indonesia and places like that have really been causing species loss and are also contributing to effects of climate change. So trying to move a little bit into agriculture and what do we expect the effects of climate change to be on agriculture? And here the results are a little bit more mixed, um, whereas we're expecting climate change to result in a lot of species being lost and habitat being lost. That's not necessarily the case um, for agriculture. So there's actually been some arguments that increased um, carb carbon emissions globally can perhaps enhance photosynthesis in many important um, grain crops such as wheat, um, rice, and then soybeans as well. Um, but this science is a little bit more uncertain. So here actually in the Pacific Northwest where I work, we're actually expecting an increase in agricultural productivity as climate changes, um, whereas in other areas, um, some third world countries, um, you know, the areas around the equator that are really kind of harder to produce crops, we're maybe expecting that agricultural yields to go down. So in this case, the science is a little bit more um, unpredictable. We're not quite sure the impacts of climate change on agricultural yields. But again, we are expecting significant disturbance to a lot of these ecosystems. And we're not really sure how all of these different factors are going to interact. So I think this is the one of the last slides I have talking about um, just climate change, but you know a lot of this is being driven by human population growth. So as the human population is growing, obviously we're converting more and more natural habitats either into agricultural habitats or urban habitats, um, increased carbon emissions through you know any kind of technology, cars, um, things like that. Um, and a lot of this human population growth that's accelerating climate change is happening in um, less developed countries. Um, so India, um, China, Africa, and then other less developed countries are really the ones that are accelerating human population growth. Whereas the human population in the United States um, and in Europe has been more stable. So here we can see a graph from 1950 through 2050 about where the human population growth is occurring and we can see pretty stable growth um, in the United States and Europe, the more developed countries. But really as um, you know, some of these areas in Asia and Africa are growing and growing, that's really where the, the culprits are for climate change and the human population growth. 
So again, just to show what effect this is having on agriculture, as the human population is growing, we see the arable land per capita is decreasing. So here on the um, x-axis we have different countries and on the y-axis we have the number of hectares of um, arable land per thousand people. So basically throughout the world we see that this is going down and down. Um, you know, where in the United States we have a decrease of 30 percent of arable land per capita. Um, India, it's more accelerated, a, a 45 percent decrease. Um, I don't have China on here, but China is fairly similar um, to India. So obviously this presents a big problem um, just for the human population as a whole. So we have a, a human, an increasing population that we have to produce food for, um, but we're able to do that with less and less land per person. So this really has obviously accelerated a lot of, you know, research into how do we increase the yields of crops, um, how do we increase um, production of crops, which often, as you know, will kind of conflict somehow oftentimes with the sustainability of cropping systems. So on one hand, we're pushing for increased yields to try and make up this gap, um, while at the same time we're trying to maximize the sustainability of our agricultural systems. So how do we really look at this? How do we do that? It's some of the areas where my lab um, conducts research. So this is kind of a schematic of what I'm going to talk about in terms of how my lab does research. Obviously um, I've presented some big issues with climate change and how that may affect ecosystems. But as a researcher, you know, we're really trying to break it down into some simple questions maybe that my lab can study and then try and interact um, with other scientists studying other areas of climate change and try and put it all together to try and see how do we mitigate these impacts of climate change in our agricultural systems. So as Alice mentioned, a lot of my research is looking at the interplay between climate and different farming systems and how that affects the insect community. So I've just highlighted here a little graphic of one particular system we work in. Um, this is a temperature map here of Washington State in the summer. So you can see here in the dark red is the area we actively work in. Um, this is a heavily irrigated area that forms the Columbia River Basin. Um, it's a very hot, and this is a precipitation map um, where darker shades of blue indicate more precipitation. So you can see it's a very dry area, high temperatures, average of about 8 to 10 inches of precipitation a year, um, but it's very great soil quality I and mean, it's a very high production area. Um, and we work a lot on, you know, how does the farming systems affect the insect communities? So we have herbivores such as aphids that are transmitting viruses to our crops. Um, things like Colorado potato beetle, which are feeding um, actively voracious feeders on our crops. And then we work with a lot of the natural enemies. So my lab really tries to understand what are these influences of climate? Um, what are the influences of, you know, how is a farmer growing their crops? Are they using organic practices? Are they using more conventional practices with a lot of inputs? How do all these things work out and affect the insect communities? So just to summarize this per first part of the talk um, and give you a little background on climate change, what are we kind of expecting? Well, we're really expecting a loss of biodiversity as we're losing habitat loss and as habitats are being converted um, from one type of habitat as they are now into other types of natural habitats. Um, so a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is what are the potential impacts of this loss of biodiversity, um, this loss of habitat on these insect communities, how is that affecting um, yields in organic cropping systems versus conventional cropping systems, and kind of where do we go. So we have these variable effects on crop yields, but again we're losing um, biodiversity. So how do all these things work together um, to affect, you know, a farming system? Okay, so the big questions that are really being looked at in my laboratory and some of the other laboratories here at Washington State University, and actually it's a, it's a big focus of research of a lot of researchers around the country are, you know, how do these different farming systems and climate change impact biodiversity? 
So within farming systems, what I mean is are growers using organic practices, conventional practices, um, you know, other kind of practices in the middle, um, things like no-till or conservation tillage, um, looking at different of these types of systems. The scale of production is something else we're really interested in. Um, we have some organic growers here in the Pacific Northwest that are producing organic um, farming on very large acreages, 120 um, acre circles um, under center pivot irrigation. So these are kind of intensive organic production systems. And then we kind of have the more traditional organic production systems, small four acre farms, mixed vegetable farms, you know, interplay between livestock and cropping systems. So we have all this variability within our organic systems and our conventional systems. So how does that impact biodiversity and how these farming systems are functioning? Um, then what might be the effects of losing biodiversity either through intensifying your farming systems or through climate change? And then finally I'll talk about how might organic farming practices or other sustainable practices potentially help you as a grower um, mediate the harmful effects of climate change um, in your cropping systems. So we'll just start here focusing on the first question, you know, how do these farming systems and climate change impact biodiversity? So just to give you a little background on this in a couple slides, why we're interested in this, um, for about 50 years it's really been well documented in the literature that kind of converting farming systems in these, into these intensive monocultures um, may in part be responsible for the pest outbreaks which are so typical of these communities. So if we see here an intensive um, potato system in Washington State, we might imagine that for the insects this is kind of like an all-you-can-eat buffet. Um, and certain pest species are going to be very effective on this potato crop. And because it's such an intensive system, it's going to be easy for a pest to kind of that's flying around to visualize, you know, where this cropping system is, to find it, um, to migrate in, and start to cause a lot of problems. As well, on the other hand, you know, we have a lot of intensive insecticide sprays in a conventional monoculture like this that may be reducing the diversity of natural enemies. Um, and which we know do a big job of controlling pests. So if this kind of idea is correct, that intensification of agriculture is causing a loss of diversity, which is actually resulting in pest outbreaks, um, fostering diversity of these natural enemies will actually help us improve pest control. So a big focus of researchers like myself who are studying sustainable and organic ag agriculture is really to look at what is the role of these natural enemies that are already out there in the systems to help control pests without using intensive insecticide sprays? But one other thing that we're really interested in is that just all biodiversity might not be the same. Um, we know that different species have different jobs in these agricultural ecosystems. Um, some predators may be more effective than others. And when we're trying to conserve species, um, we're really interested in trying to identify, you know, what are the aspects that we really need to promote in our farming system? So if we're looking at biological control, let's say, you know, do we need to promote the diversity of all the species in our farming systems, or are there just a couple that we can kind of focus on because they're really doing all of our pest control? And we have all kinds of different methods to look at what species are being effective, um, in agricultural systems, and I'll talk a little bit about those today. So a lot of my research is really trying to work in real production systems, um, you know, work with farmers to try and identify, you know, what species do they have in their farming systems, and kind of what is the role of these different species, and how do we conserve the right kind of biodiversity to really help growers produce, you know, a sustainable crop. So and this kind of requires us really to have a detailed understanding of how biodiversity really works. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about the study system we work in, which is potatoes. Um, this is one system we work in in East Central Washington. Um, so I've kind of highlighted here the, the area that is the most intensive. So this again is that Columbia River Basin 
um, which is a heavily irrigated agricultural region um, with very high productivity. And within this system, we really have two different um, types of production. And we have traditionally um, the conventional growers used calendar-based sprays of broad-spectrum pesticides, um, a lot of intensive organophosphates, um, you know, soil fumigation to control weeds, um, which, as we know, can be very harmful to pests. So you do get a benefit, obviously, of controlling your pests with these intensive sprays, um, but you're also harming the natural enemies. So one of the reasons a lot of growers um, use this kind of system is potatoes are often one of the only valuable crops, um, profitable crops in a four-year rotation, and potatoes can really be decimated um, by viruses and phytoplasma that's transmitted by aphids um, and leaf hoppers. So the growers in these systems have traditionally been very risk averse because their yields over a four-year period can be based basically entirely on production of a good crop of potatoes. So the traditional um, grower would say, you know, one aphid equals a spray. The economic threshold in an entire 120-acre field could be a single aphid or a single leafhopper. Um, this has really been an interesting industry, too, because increased in organic and sustainable production practices has kind of occurred from the top down. Um, so the big end, the purchasers of potatoes from the Pacific Northwest are the big fast food companies such as McDonald's and Wendy's and Burger King. Um, there's been a lot of pressure from these companies to force the growers to use more organic and sustainable practices. So as the, the population you know, the United States population consumers are requiring more, you know, green um, practices, sustainable practices. We've seen a shift in these companies requiring farmers to be more sustainable. So all the farmers in the system now have to pass sustainability audits that document that they're scouting for natural enemies, um, that they're using more precise economic thresholds. And this has also led to a really a big increase in organic production practices which are using natural or environmentally friendly pesticides, um, biofumigation, so our organic growers are often using mustard um, cover crops the year before, um, and the, the breakdown products from mustards are um, natural um, suppressors of weeds, and we know that this system can really promote natural enemies, but perhaps may have more pests too. So how do we kind of balance some what's going on in these systems to get a robust yield for an organic grower versus a conventional grower? So one of our big pests, some um, of our defoliating pests, is the Colorado potato beetle. Um, and here you can see on the picture on the right, this is just a, a potato farm that's been completely decimated by the potato beetle. Um, these, these guys are pretty voracious feeders. and Without control, they can really tear through a potato farm, you know, in a period of four to six weeks and, you know, cause nearly a hundred percent yield loss if they're not being effectively controlled. And in many parts of the, the country, potato beetles have evolved resistance to a lot of insecticides, so they've been tough to control. Um, this has not been as big of a problem in the Pacific Northwest, where I work, um, but these guys are still a big issue for the growers. So one of the interesting things, um, you know, we're studying these insects from an ecological perspective as well as a pest management perspective. So the potato beetles have an interesting life cycle um, for us because the eggs are laid on the plant foliage. Um, so you can see the eggs very clearly if you're out scouting in your field. They lay them in these big clumps that are quite yellow and, you know, starkly contrast against the leaves. Um, the larvae are pretty voracious feeders that will go through all the larval stages in a typical Washington or Idaho summer in seven to ten days. They'll drop off the plants, um, pupate in the soil before then emerging again as the adult. So the whole life cycle of this pest takes about 28 days. Um, and in Washington that results in about four or five different generations of this pest. So one of the reasons that this is interesting to us is because they're really attacked in our systems by a diverse community of natural enemies. 
So we have different natural enemies that are a lot of generalist feeders, which means they feed on a lot of different pest species. So we have things such as lady beetles. Um, these guys, Navis alternatus, look like miniature praying mantises and are called damsel bugs. And we have beetles that are mainly, mainly walking around on the, the ground in our potato crops and are eating things that are on the ground, so the potato beetles that are walking around before they pupate. And then in the soil, the potato beetles are attacked by a diverse group of pathogens that include nematodes and fungus. So very often when we talk to um, growers, they say that all nematodes are bad nematodes because a lot of nematodes obviously are parasitic on plants and can really reduce the yields of plants as well. But there are a lot of species of nematodes out in agriculture too that kill insects. So these nematodes are little worms that enter into the insects, release a bacteria that kind of liquefies the insect from the inside. And then you can see here is a single insect larvae and all of these guys here are nematodes that have emerged. So this is how many can emerge just from a single individual. And actually it's been estimated if you don't know about nematodes that if you just counted all the animals on Earth, that nematodes would make up about 80 or 90 percent of all the individual animals on Earth. So they're really quite abundant in natural systems and agricultural systems as well. So we started off just trying to say, hey, where do these natural enemies occur in our potato systems and is there a benefit of organic farming? Um, and I'm going to bring this back to, you know, the effects of climate change on this as well. So we have these field surveys throughout our potato growing region. Each one of these stars represents probably five or six potato fields. Um, and we work with a lot of growers that have mixed conventional and organic production systems. So we have very few growers that are dedicated organic growers in this region. Um, on the west side of Washington, we have a lot more of those smaller organic farms and up here in Washington, the four acre farms that may grow just a row or two of potatoes. But here in central Washington, we have mostly organic growers that are producing these 120 acre fields and also produce a lot of conventional acreage. So a lot of them are just kind of testing the waters for organic production and slowly converting um, as they see they're making similar or more money in many cases because they're usually getting a good premium um, markup on their organic um, products at the farm gate sales. So here's how we do insect sampling. Um, this is called a DVAC suction sampler. Um, these are a couple undergrads working in the lab. Basically this is just a lawnmower engine that's been engineered to suck insects off of the plants. Um, it's connected to this long tube that we put over the potato plants and will act like a vacuum cleaner essentially. Um, sucking insects off these plants and we can start to see what kind of insects we have in our systems as well as just putting out pitfall traps. So these are just cups in the soil um, with little funnels and the insects that walk in here will fall into the cup and will be unable to get out. So when we first started in this system, when we were really surprised that among Washington potato fields we saw very little variation in the species or the families of insects that we had present and there was absolutely no effect of management practices. So here when we're looking at predators and pathogens, we basically were finding that in organic systems we find all the same species that we find in conventional systems. And this goes a little bit against conventional wisdom because Often um, what you hear is that organic um, farming systems really promote a much greater number of species, but at least in our potato systems we found that this was not the case. Um, but I'd like to talk to you a little bit about, you know, there's different aspects of biodiversity that we're really interested in. So the most obvious one is just the number of species that you might have on your farm. I um, mean, it's clearly obvious that, you know, this is farm, say, has two predator species and it's more diverse than this one that has one and so on. We have here a more diverse system that has a third species and then a fourth. There's a second aspect of biodiversity that has been underappreciated, I think, which is what's called evenness and it relates to the balance of species on a farming system or in an ecosystem. 
whereas this system here may be dominated by the blue species and is not very diverse because the other three species are fairly rare. Um, and then we're moving to a system that all the species are kind of occurring in equal abundances. So the reason we're interested in this evenness is it re it's really common to see variation in this across real landscapes, so across farming systems that have different disturbances. You might see the same species are present, but in a conventional system you might see one species is really, really common and the other species are rare. Um, and in an organic system we might see that all the species are kind of doing okay and the, more, the system is more balanced. So this is just a graph showing this, that in our potato systems, um, here on the y-axis we have this evenness. So again, zero would indicate an ecosystem where the farm was completely dominated by a single species, um, and one is indicating an ecosystem where the farm has a bunch of different species that are all kind of relatively equal in abundance. And I'm going to talk about why this is really important in our farming systems. So we see for our natural enemies, for those pathogens that are in the soil, and for our predators, that they're really much more balanced communities in organic farming systems. So the organic growers are really doing something to promote, um, you know, greater balance among the species in their systems. So we next wanted to say, you know, is this a factor that is generally impacting natural enemies, um, or is this just occurring in our potato farm? So we did what's called a meta-analysis, which is where we looked through the scientific literature from a lot of studies across different organic and conventional cropping systems in 16 different countries, and we looked at the balance of those communities or the evenness of those communities in each field. Um, and this little spider web graph kind of shows that evenness increased in the organic systems pretty universally, so each one of these pairs connected by a line um, shows a comparison between a conventional and organic farming system. And we see a median 7% increase in the balance of the community. That may seem like a really small number, but in a couple slides I'm going to show kind of the broad impact that this actually has for a grower in an organic versus a conventional farming system. So when we look at do the trends hold for all the organisms, this is really coming back to that conventional wisdom. So we looked across all organisms in organic and conventional farming systems, and we looked at over a hundred different studies that have compared the organisms that occur in conventional systems that are paired up with a similar organic system. So as you might expect, um, here is what's called an effect size. So this is more or less kind of the proportional increase um, on an organic farm versus a conventional farm. So we see that on organic farming systems, we have about a 40% increase in the abundance of different species. Um, so you know, any of you that have walked through an organic farm or grow your crops organically, versus a conventional farm, you know, you can instantly tell which one's the organic farm. There's just a lot more insects buzzing around, you know, more spiders, things like that. Um, surprisingly, and again, against conventional wisdom, we find that organic farming does not actually promote greater numbers of species. So across many eco um, farming systems around the world, we see that organic farming systems really have the same species as conventional farming systems. But here again, when we look at just the balance of those species or the evenness, we see that really what organic farming is doing is promoting a greater evenness of the species, so more balanced communities, but has the same actual species present. So this, this might look like a typical organic versus a conventional farming system if we just plot out all the arthropod species on the x-axis and their abundance on the y-axis. Um, we typically may say, you know, we have a lot of variability here on the conventional system, you know, some species are rare and some are dominant, whereas the organic, everything is kind of similarly abundant. So that's the effect of farming systems. Um, what's the effect of climate change? So again, we plotted all these different farming systems and we can look at variation in the climates across these regions and kind of use this this is a little zoom in here of our regions. 
So basically the way that we study climate change in, in my lab and a lot of other labs is to kind of use natural variation in temperature and precipitation across the landscape, look at the insect communities in these different regions, and relate that to climatic effects. So when we plot this variable evenness, which I said is promoted by organic farming, here when we look at increases in temperature on the x, on x axis and the evenness of those natural enemies on the y, we see an act, a negative effect of increased um, temperature, which is one of the expectations of climate change. So again, while we're getting a benefit of organic farming to biodiversity, we're getting a decrease in biodiversity due to climate change. So how does this all work together? We, um, organic farming is promoting biodiversity, um, but climate change is degrading biodiversity. So what is really the effect here is, you know, the next question that we're interested in. So on one hand, as an organic grower, you're doing a lot of work to promote your biodiversity. Can this kind of counteract any negative effects of climate change? So to do this, um, we used an experimental approach. Um, we tried to look at you know, go back to those potato farms, um, look at the farms that vary in this, um, the balance of the predators and the species that are present, and try and see if we have any positive effect on the control of our major pests, the Colorado potato beetle. So if we look at our, at our, at our farms across our landscape, um, this represents seven farms from our production systems where farm A has a lot of dominant species, this geocra species, which is called the big eye bug. And then we kind of have variability to, you know, here's an actual farmer that has a relatively even distribution of his natural enemies on his farm. So these all represent real farming systems with farmers we work with in Washington. Again, when you're looking at the pathogen side of things, we have a farmer here who his system is dominated by a single pathogen species um, all the way up to a farmer you know, that has a relatively equal distribution of these three species um, on his farm. So when we're doing this in an experiment, this is what our experimental design looks like. So this is a, a field experiment on an actual um, research farm um, where we have variation in this the balance of the predator community, and then the balance of the pathogen community. And then we have all kinds of the different possible combinations here that you might see on a farming system, an organic farming system in Washington. So really, what's the effect of kind of this community here that all the species are relatively even distributed versus this community that's kind of dominated by just two single species? So again, I said this is a, a field experiment, so we have these large production cages. Um, we put potato plants out in these cages um, and all the potato beetle life stages, and we run the experiment for about one generation and see what's the impact on the pest densities, what's the impact on the yields for a farmer. So here's the results of this particular experiment um, on this left panel. On the x-axis, we have this balance of the predator community or the evenness of the predator community. On the y-axis, we have um, the balance of that pathogen community in the soil. And then we have the number of potato beetles remaining. And this plane basically shows the two-dimensional trend in the data. So we see as you have a more balanced community of natural enemies or pathogens that a farmer would get fewer and fewer pests. So promoting this aspect of biodiversity could be really important for a grower um, and seems to be product, um, affected positively by organic farming practices. Similarly here, um, these guys are pretty voracious feeders, so as you have a better, more balanced community of predators or pathogens, we see that a grower would get larger and larger plants. Um, I'm actually going to skip through this side pretty quickly, but one of the reasons this happens is that in more balanced communities, we see greater survival of the particular natural enemies. So the natural enemies appear to feed less on each other, and they focus more on the pests um, when they're occurring kind of in a balanced community. So when we look at just the effects on our real farming systems, um, and we plot out, you know, using those those suction samples where we're collecting the insects from the field, we see that farmers that are really promoting um, greater evenness of their fields 
um, we see a distinct correlation where those farmers are getting fewer and fewer beetles, sorry, and larger and larger plants. So this is really having a positive benefit for farmers in real production um, systems. So just to summarize um, some of this information, we see that this organic farming is promoting more balanced communities or natural enemies. This is kind of occurring despite negative effects of climate change. So organic farming really seems to um, be a mitigating factor that could potentially help farmers mitigate any negative effects of climate change. Um, when we scale this up to actually the organic farmers that we work with, I said we get this 7% increase in kind of the balance of the species. That actually can scale up to 20 to 30% larger yields um, just from the benefits provided by those natural enemies. So it may seem that some of these little shifts in the community are not that important, but when you look at the impacts on the pests and how that's magnified, um, being a farmer trying to really promote a more balanced community of species on your farm um, can really lead to a lot of benefits in terms of um, greater yields. So here we see that organic farming potentially offers a real solution to the difficult challenge of promoting um, balance among the species on your farms. And this kind of, as I said, occurs um, despite the effects of climate change. So again, I'm going I'm to go through this slide a little quickly um, just because we're running out of time, but why might this effect occur? Um, if we have like different production systems here um, and we say that, you know, as we're increasing the number of organisms, if kind of the outer square is your entire farm, that eventually one predator in a very uneven system can kind of fill up its entire role in the ecosystem and the other species are not abundant enough to do their job, um, where in a more balanced community, everyone is kind of doing their job. So a nice analogy for this would be, you know, if you had 100 people in a town and, you know, 90 of them were, say, barbers or something like that, um, there'd be more barbers than people that needed haircuts. But if everyone was kind of equally distributed between different jobs, um, you know, all of the jobs would be getting done in a more effective fashion. And the same really holds true for natural enemies and other species that when everyone is kind of in balance, um, all the jobs are getting done more effectively and no one species is just kind of becoming redundant. So really when we're talking about, you know, does this have any value for farmers? Um, you know, these are a couple of farmers that we've worked with out here in Washington. You know, sh should they really care about promoting this balance? Um, if they're shifting to more organic or sustainable practices, does this provide a benefit to them? Um, so we know that in our farming systems that organic farming systems um, can produce yields close to conventional farms. So we have about a 15% reduction in yield um, in farming systems of potatoes. Um, but we think that this difference would be even larger if these organic farming systems were not promoting biodiversity. So here we see the organic growers are potentially kind of making up the gap, making up the benefits provided by insecticides um, by using these more um, sustainable practices. So if we look at some of the crops that may benefit the most, um, this is a recent paper that came out this year um, that talked about the yields of organic and conventional crops. So some of the crops where the yield difference between organic and conventional is the greatest are cereals and vegetable crops. So for these growers, um, it may be particularly important to try and promote biodiversity on the farms to help make up that yield gap that they could get under conventional crops. Um, whereas some other crops such as fruits, um, organic farmers are typically producing yields similar to conventional already. And a lot of this also may be due to more effective natural enemies on those, those cropping systems. Um, again, just to look down on the breakdown of which crops are typically the greatest yield gaps between conventional and organic, we see for non-legumes, um, organic yields are really much lower than conventional typically as well as for annual cropping systems. So these are the kind of cropping systems where promoting biodiversity may be the most uh, beneficial to help me make up the gap. Um, again, one final slide just to look at this. Um, some of the big crops, um, maize, barley, wheat, the cereals, um, 
you know, are really getting much lower yields on organic cropping systems, whereas things such as soybean are, are more closely related from organic to conventional. So just to bring this back, how does organic farming or other sustainable practices mediate this harmful effect? So we know that climate change can negatively impact biodiversity. Um, hopefully I've been able to show you that organic farming practices, and we have some hypotheses about why this might occur, and I'm happy to take questions about that. So organic farming can help really promote biodiversity that might otherwise be degraded by climate change um, and help you as a farmer or a grower uh, Unmuted. make up the gap. Um, some other aspects of organic farming that we know could help potentially be mediate harmful effects of climate change. As I said, promoting biodiversity is one. We see not just with insects, but other organisms tend to be more diverse than organic farming systems. Um, organic farming systems have also been shown to have greater nutrient cycling. Um, so this is a really key ecosystem service in farming systems. Um, we often see that organic farms um, do a better job of cycling these nutrients through the system um, and so this could potentially be another factor that helps um, promote the productivity of organic farming systems despite effect of climate change. Um, going to the next one, pollination. There's also been a lot of documentation that pollinators seem to be more effective on organic farming systems. Um, so again, as these habitats are changing, um, organic farmers who are perhaps having a more diverse mixture of crops on their habitat are not applying these harmful inputs, are going to get these pollination benefits. Um, a big impact of climate change has been shifts in pollinator communities um, where pollinators are kind of getting out of sync with the flowers they're supposed to be pollinating due to climate change. Um, and again, organic farming can potentially promote diversity of these pollinator groups um, and give you a benefit that you might not be getting as a conventional grower. Um, and finally, you know, the area that I work on the most, biological control, um, we really see that organic farming systems are kind of promoting this diversity of species um, that can help overcome maybe any harmful effects of climate change that might impact a single species more than others. So some of the reasons we think this occurs, just as a summary, are that you know species on organic farming, as you have this greater diversity, um, they act more complementary in their interactions with each other. Um, whereas if any one species um, is doing a single job, different species are doing another job, and so all the jobs are kind of getting done more effectively. And then we have something which calls an, an insurance effect. So you might imagine if climate change or any kind of disturbance to your farming system has a really negative impact on one species, um, an organic farm, more so than a conventional farm, will have other species that kind of maybe are not as affected by that disturbance and can still perform the job that's necessary and help make up the gap. So just as a summary of the whole talk, um, you know, we have a lot of evidence, mostly through models and projections, that climate change is really expected to reduce biodiversity and degrade some of these services on real farming systems, um, reduce biological control, reduce the effectiveness of pollinators. Um, but organic agriculture and just perhaps other practices that are less intensive or more sustainable can help mediate these negative effects by promoting biodiversity of species um, promoting these services getting accomplished on the farms. Um, so really the increased adoption of organic practices may help alleviate the harmful effects of climate change in agricultural systems. And so this is something we see very commonly in Washington and we're trying to branch out to other systems as well. Um, I'd just like to thank, we work with a lot of um, different scientists and growers as well as a lot of extension agents. Um, we really have a great team here in Washington um, and you know we work interactively with people at Oregon State University and University of Idaho as well and we have a great group of growers too that we work with that are very interested in organic and sustainable practices and it's really been a pleasure to work with them um, because you know we learn a lot from you know just the growers experiences on the grounds that really can help inform the research we do. Um, if you're more interested in any of this uh, research, this is the last slide. Uh, 
you know, there's some links. Um, you can go to my webpage. We have some links to some of this research and that has some information that you can um, download or publications. Um, and then we've we've had some stories um, featured in um, like the New York Times and other places that really talk about the potential benefits of organic farming and how that might affect um, resilience to climate change and things like that. So I welcome you to uh, check out any of these links and um, email me if you'd like any more information or give me a phone call. I'm happy to uh, take phone calls um, if you have any questions after this. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to back to Alice and take any questions from the group. First question, um, can you talk about the snowpack and water availability for your irrigation dependent farmers, both organic and conventional? Um, so most of our farmers that we work with are located in the uh, Columbia Basin Irrigation District. So there, there is some big reservoirs up in the northern part of the district that kind of farms out all of the irrigation for the whole region. Um, so, and the di different counties have different rights to that water. Um, so some counties that are a little bit older agricultural reasons um, seem to get higher priority in that irrigation district. Um, you know, so most of the growers that we work with are not dealing with snowpack per se as providing their irrigation, but they're working through the state and this Columbia Basin Irrigation um, District. So hopefully that answers that question. Okay, um, we have several co questions coming in about biodiversity. Um, first one is, what about biodiversity on organic monoculture versus organic multiculture? So that's a really excellent question um, that we're, you know, a lot of our research now is starting to shift towards looking at, you know, or obviously organic farming is not just a, a blanket term that covers everything. As I mentioned at the beginning, you know, we have these big monocultures versus kind of smaller organic systems that have a lot of different crops. Basically, in general, what we're finding is greater diversity of habitats, whether that be different crops on your farm. Um, a lot of organic growers will mix in flowering crops to kind of promote pollinators and provide, you know, habitat and sugar resources for natural enemies. So we tend to see that the more diverse organic cropping systems that have more kind of different crops per unit area or are really kind of more integrated in with the natural habitats have not only more species but also a greater balance of those species compared to these big monocultures. And we also see within these monocultures that you do see an effect on biodiversity which is from like the distance to the edge of the farm. Um, so as you kind of move into the center and you have, you know, less chances for species to migrate in, we see less and less diversity. So really on the smaller scale organic farming systems that are really diverse, we see great benefits for biodiversity um, that really exceed those on the monocultures. Okay, um, here we have a comment. It says the hypothesis that managing biodiversity will enhance pest management has not been proven over the past 50 years. Rather, it has been largely disproven. Merely increasing diversity or evenness will not necessarily improve management of insect or nematode pests. In many situations, increasing diversity will exacerbate pest problems, if you could comment on that. So, you know, this area of research, which is called biodiversity and ecosystem functioning, has been going on pretty steadily since the 1990s. Um, there's some evidence from a few systems that increasing biodiversity of say natural enemies if you add more species you actually get some effects where the different species will start to feed on each other and perhaps that could cause a decrease in something like biological control. Overall the evidence from a lot of experimental studies have shown that biodiversity is a positive thing. Um, to get at the comments more directly, um, one of the flaws of a lot of experimental work that has gone on is that the experiments are not related 
to kind of what's going on in real farming systems. So the experimental manipulations and what some people have done out in the field has been very artificial and very generic. Um, so that's kind of an area that our research has tried to address, which is trying to really encapsulate what is the variation on actual farms and trying to replicate that in some kind of controlled way on a farming system. We're hoping that, you know, through some of the experiments like I talked about here that are really trying to rep reproduce more um, realistic scenarios that we'll start to see whether or not this is a general effect that biodiversity is positive. Um, I will note too, you know, it is a good comment um, that I, you know, we tried to talk in the beginning that not all biodiversity is a good thing. Um, so you really have to understand on a farming system to farming system basis um, how the different species are interacting because in some cases you may just need to promote the diversity of a single species and biodiversity per se is not that important um, whereas in other systems you know where different species are having complementary interaction um, you may need to promote biodiversity per se so there has been some experimental research that shows that if you can just target like the one or two species that are really effective in your system that's all that really matters and biodiversity doesn't matter whereas in other systems you know we do see a, an effect of biodiversity where multiple species are doing more than any single species so thanks for the comment it really is variable from system to system and my hope is that more and more researchers are trying to do things that replicate what's going on on real farms and that will hopefully provide more insight over the next five to ten years about how these processes operate Okay. Um, what kind of landscape features of organic farms promote evenness? Is it plant diversity, farm size, etc.? Um, so it's, that's a good question, something we're also doing research on. Um, we think it's a combination of all of those things. Um, as I said, the larger organic farms that tend to be more monoculture-like um, tend to have reduced evenness. Um, we see often a benefit of reduced inputs. So we often have a lot of variability in organic farms and how many pesticide sprays or you know things like copper, the fungicides that the growers are putting out. So reductions in those inputs seems to promote evenness. Um, diversity of plants within the farm often provides a benefit of evenness too. And then when I'm Talking about landscapes, we often see that the kind of the different habitats that are surrounding your farm also have a big input. So farmers that have more, are their farm is located in kind of a mixture of an agricultural region with maybe some natural habitat. Um, the most natural habitat where I work is kind of a shrub step habitat. So we see that there are benefits at really a larger scale, like a three to five kilometer scale outside of your field. Um, whereas if you have a diverse mixture of habitats at that scale, you get a benefit for even this too. Um, obviously, that's often out of the control of a farmer. So within your field, um, some of the things that we recommend are, you know, trying to promote a diverse rotation of crops. Um, you know, if it's economically feasible, you know, trying to have different cropping systems on your farm. You know, trying to limit your impacts as much as you can you know, to, while you can still produce, you know, economically valuable yields, but, you know, all of these things are kind of interacting to promote evenness. Um, it's not one thing um, over the other. They kind of all seem to have different positives and negatives. Okay. Um, do you have any comments on the transitional period going from conventional to organic? Did biodiversity increase quickly or how, take time to build up? Um, you know, we, we've seen with a lot of our growers who I said are mixed conventional organic growers that that transitional period really is the toughest time because biodiversity doesn't seem to kind of respond immediately. Um, we often see kind of changes in abundance um, happen relatively quickly. Um, we think that that is you know, due to reduced insecticide inputs and other things as you're making the conversion from conventional to organic. Um, but biodiversity seems to take a little bit longer. So, you know, after the two or three year transitional period is over, 
um, that's when we really see the biodiversity effects starting to really accumulate, um, you know, which is another reason that, you know, the transitional period is obviously really hard for growers and is usually the time, you know, when they're struggling to make ends meet and trying to make, you know, profits that are similar to their conventional farms. But we do have some evidence that if you can kind of weather that transitional period, that the organic growers are making as much or not more and then have that those benefits of biodiversity. Um, I will say that a lot of our growers, um, rather than going through that transitional period, are doing things like reclaiming land from CRP, um, and you know that they don't have to go through the convention, the transitional period. So we sometimes see weird effects where, you know, things like soil quality are actually worse than our organic farming systems for several years because they're reclaiming kind of natural habitat and not having to go through that period. But for the growers that do go through the period, it does take a little while. So, you know, that is a struggle to kind of get through that period if you're shifting from conventional. Okay. Um, do you have Lebia grandis in the potatoes there? And if so, do they affect the Colorado potato beetle population? I'm sorry, can you... Uh, can you repeat the question? Yeah, somebody wanted to know if we, if you had Lebia grandis in the potatoes, and oh, if that affected the beetle population. So, you know, we have found Lebia. I mean, usually our carabid population. So Lebia is a, you know, a carabid beetle that's kind of a specialist predator on the eggs and larvae of the potato beetles. And for those that don't know. Um, we do find it, but it does not tend to be very common in our system. So we don't think that it's really uh, that important in the system. Um, you know, the, whoever had this question, the, the carabid beetle that we find the most commonly in our potato systems is called the bimbidian. So that's the genus. Um, that one tends to make up about 90% or more of those ground foraging beetles. Um, so at least in our region, um, the levia doesn't appear to be that important. It, I think it's more important, um, you know, out east and in some of the other regions. But you know, we do think some of the carabids are important. But that one is really rare. Um, we're not finding it hardly at all in our systems. Okay. Um, here's a comment about the field cage design. Um, this comment says that you can't learn anything, you can't put a bunch of insects in field cages, learn anything about their behavior and interaction in the real world because the insect's natural behavior is affected by being in a cage. Because they're in a cage, the big predators will eat the other predators and some of them will hang out on the cages waiting for prey. Um, it's a good comment. Um, you know, it's a comment that we get all the time. Um, so it's a little bit, you know, there's two sides to this coin, really, is that, you know, when we're looking just out on a potato farm, um, we do see this correlation between increases in predator evenness and decreased pest densities. Um, so when we're actually working out on the real farms, you know, we see that this relationship that happens in our cages is actually occurring in the real fields as well. Um, the problem with those kind of data, obviously, is that in a real potato farm, there's a lot going on, um, and there's a lot of other factors that we cannot control. Um, so, you know, the way that we get around that is to do some experimental work in field cages. Um, I fully agree and accept that a field cage um, is not a perfect reflection of reality, but it's one of the only methods that we have as a scientist to really kind of manipulate a specific aspect of biodiversity. Um, you know, if we're working with plant systems only, we can kind of do that outside. But when we're dealing with a predator community and trying to study um, biodiversity effects, we have to kind of isolate them because we can't really manipulate them in an open field environment. So I, I appreciate the comment and I recognize the limitation of that. And that's kind of one of the reasons that we try to link results from these kind of experiments to data that's going on in our real production systems to see if 
for example, this evenness effect we see in our cage is just totally meaningless out in the field. Um, but we do see this effect kind of carrying over to the field, um, you know, when we even when we have all this other variation going on. So that's a good comment. Um, you're you're completely right. Um, but you know, this is really one of the ways that we can manipulate these things and and study them. Okay, um, here's another question about the sustainable certification for the large-scale um, farmers in eastern Washington. Are their farmers really doing anything different than before certification? You mean after they're certified, are they doing anything differently? Than yeah, I think, I think um, the question is about who's doing the sustainable certification and what that sustainable certification means. Um, and the person goes on to say that he worked as a field scout for a private pest management company in the Columbia Basin in the mid-70s, and they just scouted the fields and gave a report to the grower. But if there was one PJ pit found, they sprayed the field, and the fear of net necrosis virus destroying the marketability of the crop kept them on the pesticide treadmill. So he's wondering if anything has changed. If anything's changed since the 1970s? Well, in terms of, um, I guess, the pesticide threshold. Um, you know, I'm I'm not sure I can totally answer that question because I'm not sure what all the requirements were back in the in the 70s. Um, you know, I think a lot of the things have are still very similar. Um, that you know, there's kind of a seven-step guide to the farmers getting the organic certification, which is kind of first contacting the Washington State Department of Agriculture organic food program. Um, then, you know, kind of just trying to figure out what the certification guide and rules are, completing an application packet and submitting the fees. Um, those applications are then reviewed, including they have to have an organic system plan. I think, um, actually, the question was more about the sustainable certification and what that means, rather than the organic certification. Does that make sense? Um, so, you know, I'm not sure exactly if things have totally changed um, in terms of the sustainable certification. Like, you know, we have that program is run through Washington State University. Um, I'd encourage them to look. It's run through the Crop and Soils uh, Sciences Department. They have a lot of literature on that sustainability certificate. Um, so I'd encourage this, uh, you know, viewer to kind of read through that literature and I'm happy to provide the links and they can look and see if kind of things have changed. Um, I think some of the regulations have probably changed since the 1970s in terms of what insecticides are used obviously and things like that. Um, I think it's kind of narrowed down the different products that they can use and the inputs on the field. But I think a lot of things have probably stayed the same in the last 10 to 15 years for sure. Okay, thank you. And um, there's one more question here. Um, are, can you recommend any good resources for growers of um, good perennials by region to increase biodiversity or discuss that at all? Um, so, you know, I'm happy to, you know, we have different um, systems that we've analyzed and, you know, I'd have to go through all the different data, but, you know, we have different publications and stuff that are available on the website where we have large um, databases of which crops are used in which different regions and are promoting biodiversity. Um, you know, I know more about perennials in my system um, where we do see you know, big benefits across the board in tree fruits um, as being a really important perennial um, that can promote biodiversity when you're shifting to organic production practices. Um, I don't know as much about perennials outside of the Pacific Northwest that are really beneficial, um, but here we see that kind of across the board with apples and cherries and pears, um, as well as with wine grapes that you know, organic systems are promoting greater biodiversity. Um, you know, I would encourage whoever provided this comment to kind of, we have different manuscripts that are available on my website that have databases that detail studies from different regions of the United States and whether the crops are annual and perennial. Um, they could look through some of that information and try and see for their specific region on some of the stuff that we've documented. But I really don't know as much of outside of the Pacific Northwest on perennials. 
Okay, thanks. Yeah, and I provided the link again that was on Dave's slide um, at the top there to his website. Um, we have a couple more minutes, so I guess we can take one last question, and that is, um, hold on one second here. Okay, um, what crop rotations are being used by these 120 acre farms? Do the farmers plant any green manure or cover crops? And you mentioned that um, some of these farmers are transitioning towards an organic system. So would you say that these new systems may take many years to develop before we can see their full potential? Um, that's definitely true. Um, you know, we have you know, the potato growers are using different cover crops. Um, you know, they often use um, different pulse crops or mustards as kind of cover cropping systems. Some of the potato growers are doing um, a fallow rotation as part of their rotations. Um, we often see potatoes are being rotated with different pulses um, in Washington. A lot of the growers are using either a three or four year um, rotation. Um, we don't necessarily think that the benefits are just from the production system of the potatoes, but it's kind of the whole, you know, as you're shifting to organic as a whole and you're putting less inputs in, um, kind of all of those years are providing benefits. So it's not just different years where you have potatoes that you're going to get benefits, but kind of throughout time. But as I did say, you know, as you're going through this transitional plan, you know, it takes a while for these benefits to kind of accrue, especially if you're just doing organic in a very small, isolated region and there's still a lot of conventional around because obviously the effects of what your neighbor is doing or other areas in your farm are going to matter. Um, so it does take a while. You know, that, that can be a struggle sometimes for organic growers and we fully realize that and we kind of recommend that a lot of our growers kind of shift slowly. Um, and I think that's what the majority of our growers in these big systems do is kind of just shift slowly like one circle at a time to organic and kind of see how it works and they move on from there because it does take a while for you know benefits to soil quality and things like that to really accrue in the organic systems. Um, you know there's a great paper recently in the journal Nature by uh, Veronica Seifert who's at McGill University that talks about kind of yields in organic and conventional farming systems and relates that to the years of transition. So I'd encourage um, people to try and look up that paper. I mean, if they can get, if they can't get access to it, I'm happy to send it along. And that talks about kind of the transitional period and when the benefits actually start accruing and stuff like that. Okay, um, we're just about out of time here, but um, I'd like to thank everyone for their questions and comments and mention once again that you can find our many other recorded presentations on organic farming topics at the link on your screen.